Crane. It's I'm Rob Kramars. This is George Kenny, Desiree Dubois, <laughs> and, and a number of individuals who are interns who I'll be introduced in a moment. This is the crew of Entrepreneurs Bootcamp, which is a joint venture of George and I and his company, Shepherd Ventures and Intelliversity. And um, Desiree is here to talk about her experience as a female entrepreneur, as a woman entrepreneur, and how she um, helps other women entrepreneurs to make their visions into reality. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's well, that's welcome, uh, Desiree. Um, we have uh, 10 interns, but uh, some of them are um, away because of exams or, or Chinese New Year. And uh, right. I'd just like to introduce uh, uh, five interns that we have here. Um, please uh, tell us who you are. And uh, my name is Elsie. I'm a master of finance student. I already school management in the industry. And I'm now responsible for Oxford fixed income spreadsheets. Wow, numbers. You're a numbers girl. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Jojo, and I'm also the Master of Finance student in the Valley right now. And my main job right now is to take um, charging the interface for the George's portfolio. Fantastic. Hunter, get yourself on the camera. <laughs> um, I'm Hunter. I'm uh, working with Rob on the Intelliversity um, client uh, acquisition as well as the research project that we're doing. Fantastic, thank you. Well, nice to meet you. I'm Stone. I'm, I'm a student at Reddy School, Region in Finance, and I'm now working on the hate map. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, hello, nice to meet you. And, uh, I'm, I'm Lester, and I'm also a graduate student in Reddy Management School, and I'm uh, working on uh, a geologist portfolio now. Wow, fantastic. So, some of you are still in school, or all of you graduates? No, we're still, we're still in school. Still, still yeah, in school. Okay, fantastic. School. Welcome. And uh, we've had 26 uh, interns, and one of the things that we try to do when they graduate is get them jobs. And of the 26 interns that we've had, we've gotten 20 jobs. Fantastic. So uh, many of them are with our portfolio companies or just the network of uh, companies and investors that we know uh, through our course of business. So welcome, Desiree. Um, we are uh, really uh, pleased to have you here because uh, you're a seasoned entrepreneur, which you're gonna tell us about, and you have a focus on women. We've had um, a number of uh, successful women uh, interns, and uh, they'd all, uh, everybody would like to hear about your story, but in particular, uh, about your passion for helping uh, women. So why don't you just tell us uh, what you're about, and, and Great. They, they can ask questions. Great, thank you. I'll just go through a brief uh, rundown of my background, because I, say that I started um, business at 12 years old, so that's when I had my first business. I have not officially ever worked with somebody as an employee or got an employee check. So the first business, uh, they say, what did you do at 12? I used to go to dance lessons on Saturday, and then Saturday afternoon, I would teach younger children dance lessons at the community center. So it really was a glorified babysitting service, because you know, the parents would drop them off, I would teach them dance lessons and so forth. But when we had our recital, uh, and had to do our costumes, I did costumes and recital, and. We had a really big uh, recital at one point where my sister was selling tickets and my brother was doing the music in the back. Uh, but the management came in and the management wanted to shut us down because we had exceeded occupancy. So at that age, you know, he said, didn't you see this sign? It's like, no, at 12 years old, I wasn't noticing the occupancy sign on the door. <laughs> and I didn't even know what it was. Uh, so fortunately, they let us continue the show, but they wouldn't let me participate or do anything else there thereafter. But the lessons learned in every business that I have, you know, the, I don't, we were talking about failure, I don't believe in failures. You know, sometimes things don't work out the way you anticipated it, but you take that lesson and you utilize that going forward. So the lesson was that many times we don't realize what we, the talents that we have that we can teach others. So no matter where we are, sometimes people wait to get certified and get you know all these different levels of education before they feel they're qualified to teach somebody else, and it's not necessarily true. There's always someone who doesn't know what you know. So that's a gift that all of us have. We can always be able to monetize should we choose to do that. Then my second uh, project was when in school, we had these fundraisers where you sell the world's famous chocolate bars. Do you gentlemen remember any of that? You remember oh, the yeah. world's famous chocolate bar? Oh, yeah. So one day, it's like a fundraiser. So one day I counted the pieces on the bar and I realized there were 12 chunks, 12 pieces on that chocolate bar. Chocolate bars were a dollar. If I sold each piece for 10 cents, 
then I would make 20 cents on each bar. And so instead of me going door to door knocking, I would go to the playground where all the kids, they didn't have a dollar, but they had 10 cents. And as soon as recess came, they would run up to me and buy 10 cent pieces of the chocolate bar. So I made profits on each bar. Then I got the prize for selling the most chocolate bars. <laughs> so that was and that the lesson from that was is that many times we have something that is large and we're trying to get that big dollar for it. But suppose you broke it down into pieces where your audience would be able to buy it piece by piece. Then of course you can discount if they buy the whole thing, but then you have something you can always sell from that point on piece of on it. Um, the next project was Hi there. Hi. Uh, welcome. Yeah. This um, is Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi. Thanks for joining us. This is Desiree. Okay. So another project was um, from the chocolate bars to I was going to USC for school. I live in Marina Del Rey. I realized that they had a lot of the boats there. The gentleman would have fun on the boats the weekend, but they didn't want to clean them up. So I en en enrolled some of the ladies from school to come during their breaks, and then we cleaned the boats. We called it Marina Mermaid Service. And we had little blue t-shirts that had Marina and the Mermaid MAID on it. We advertised in the local Argonaut, which is a local newspaper to the area. And uh, we charged $35 at that time where I got 15, they got 15, and $5 was applied towards the supplies. It was like a little blue bucket with all the supplies. So they come to my apartment, pick up the bucket, and go clean the boats and, and do as many as they can. $15 cash was a lot of money for a college student, especially to do in between your classes. And that worked out great until one day when the ladies were smoking on the boat and the, um, the uh, cushion caught on fire. So the boat owner said, you know, we, of course we replaced it, but he said we needed to have insurance. If we didn't have insurance, he would report us. Well, at that age, you know, 18, 19, and then having these million dollar boats, it was prohibitive. It took away all of our profits. So we, I stopped it. I always thought I was going to be able to go back to it. But the lesson learned from that is that when you're doing the business, there really are certain things you have to have, basics like your insurance, your accounting, and your uh, legal. And many times it's so easy to start a business. People go and start a business by just putting a website up and going into business. Right now, you really need to budget and have, whether it's you know trade or dollars, have your baselines covered because people uh, now won't give you warning many times they'll just actually sue you. So. That was lessons from that. So I did, a, after that, Molly School and Agency, where I would uh, believe that we had, um, we prepare for a big show, because I believe experience is the best teacher. And so we would train these models and actors and dancers through um, weeks of training for this big production. And at that big production, we had all the top modeling agencies and agents that would come and actually hire them from that. So they would do the modeling, the dancing, and we actually had our own cosmetic makeup line that we private labeled. We had our own t-shirt, work, workout clothes the line. We actually wanted to buy a hair salon that was downstairs in the building. So we really had all, we covered it from all the different angles. We had our own photography studio. So everything the model needed, we were able to acquire, you know, to acquire for them. And that just got really, really, really big. And I, um, you know, that was when I first made my first million dollars in the business, but I didn't have the structure that I've said to you, I didn't have a good attorney, I didn't have a good accounting system, I didn't have you know, good insurance, and little things happened that kind of caused that business to this, you know, and then I eventually got married and I had children, so I didn't, they just kind of grew out of that business. Sometimes we grow out of our businesses, our dreams, our visions, sometimes they no longer work for us, whether it's the business itself, or whether it's us being able to implement it and continue doing it, um, but, you phase through and you just go to the next and to the next. <coughs> okay, I was like, <laughs> so from there, I think the most recent ones was an empowered woman. I was in real estate for many years, and that's when I got married and had children. And I didn't want to just sell houses, I wanted to build portfolios. So I um, used to tell people, like, I will sell you the house, and then we'll be able to take the equity and then buy a second house. A rental, take the equity, get into something larger, get into something larger. So that way, I thought I'd have less clients make the same amount of money as far as having lots of clients. Mm -hmm. And we built like a, a trust factor. And so I really have adapted a lot of my businesses to the less is more, because we think the more things we do, if you have all these multiple streams of income uh, or revenue, I like to take one thing that has multiple streams as opposed to different businesses. At least until you, everything is well, you know, it's that oil, well-oiled machine going for itself. So we did the real estate um, and it was really successful. That's where I made a million dollars as well, multi-million dollars because I actually 
did deals where I could fix and flip and get investors involved and then we did multi-residentials, we did condo conversions, we did triple net, we just did a lot of different things. Um, and the market fell, the market changed. Did but you get a real estate license? I was a broker. Yeah. I eventually was a broker. It's in 1979, I got my license, and I think about 85, I got my license. And you worked license. for a larger firm. I, yeah, originally I worked for a Charles, I mean, John Douglas, and Caldwell Banker, okay. and Remax, and then eventually I wound up doing, just brokering the deals myself, and called it Arlen Group, I created my own company called the Arlen Group, okay. which we still have today for investments in real estate. Um, but I wanted more women to get involved in real estate, so I would, and a lot of them had the, state, had the money, and they had the credit, but they just really weren't thinking about it. They were thinking more of their fashions and their new purse and vacations and things of that type. So I started inviting them to my home. I thought if I could share with my sis story, that would motivate them to be able to pursue their dreams. But when we got there, we realized it was more emotional. They didn't have community, they didn't have resources, they didn't have, this was 12 years ago. So the internet was not as refined as it was now. They didn't have the social media. They didn't have you know, a sisterhood. And I think, the sisterhood or the brotherhood is one of the most important factors you're going to have as an entrepreneur because it's otherwise it's a very, very lonely road to success. You know, and not just your team, people that you hire. You need people that you can just kind of cry to, people that you can um, be honest with, you know, be politically incorrect, you know, if you need to, just be able to be blood. Because again, there's so much protocol in being an entrepreneur and being a professional business person. So what, who do you talk to when you are feeling like you want to quit? Who do you talk to when you are maxed out on your credit cards? Who do you, and you're broke, you know? Who do you talk to when you really um, have a problem, a staff problem or whatever it's, so you need that sisterhood, you need that community or brotherhood to be able to connect with, and that's what they didn't have. So we got so involved in that part, um, and because I had the experience of being an entrepreneur and experience of a lot of different things that they've experienced, then uh, we kind of morphed. I, that was the end of my real estate career, and that was the beginning of an empowered woman. And so for 12 years, we supported women in starting, fixing, and building their businesses. That they were just starting, they were under six figures. They were six figures, and then they had seven figures and above. Because they needed different things at different levels. We did masterminds, we did seminars, we did webinars, we did videos, we did podcasts, we did luxury um, events. You know, I wanted, they were probably, I felt like women and men or in the trenches so much of their life that it's nice we're gonna have lunch at a Mountain Gate Country Club or a restaurant in Beverly Hills. Or we went to polo <coughs> games, we did mission trips, we went to Brazil, we went to Haiti to be able to give back and train other women that were starting businesses because we had that skill set. And giving back is such a nurturing thing because what you give to others is the gift you give to yourself. You know, so we encourage that. So we did all that with them, but then the market changed. People weren't able to spend as much money on memberships and trips and things of that type. And so that was a perfect time for me because I also lost all of my real estate. I lost 10 properties and two apartment buildings. So I needed to say, okay, what am I gonna do? Because that was always my backup plan. You know, that when I, you know, I did Empower Woman, we made a lot of money through that, but I figured if all else fails, then we gave away probably more than we actually earned. But I had the real estate, but when that went away, I had to look at it again and say, okay, now at this point in my life, what am I able to do to, you know, bring all that back. And I know I couldn't do it alone. I didn't have the bandwidth or I don't have the years to do it the way I did before. It was like to buy a property every year. I don't have 10 more years to build my portfolio. So I thought, what do I really want to do now? I want to be, I want more freedom and flexibility. Um, so, cause I, my children were gone, I became an empty nester and I was single. Um, and I wanted to be able to still build my real estate, but also still stay connected to the women's business. So I said, I just, one day I just said, I just want to live where I work and work where I live, I wanna do it anywhere in the world. And then that's when I created Homework, you know, and that's exactly what it is. It's, we acquire luxury style homes, I wanna stay, our branding has always been luxury style, because that way again, not necessarily with the luxury prices, but it's luxury style so that people can live up to their potential. And, um, and we acquire the, the homes and we design the bedrooms to be live work suites, so they can live there and work there full time part-time or as a drop-in. So think Airbnb meets WeWork. Um, we have conference rooms, we have uh, offices, we have a classroom that you can have up to 10 people in the classroom and doing presentations or you can take the, everything out as a flex space and have yoga or you know, dance or exercise or spa, whatever you want in there. We have a studio where we have you know backdrops, green screen, podcast, video equipment for those who want to create 
something that's needed in the media. And we do a lot of events. It's a great place to do events, launches, uh, meetings, breakouts, uh, retreats. People come for a week and they train and they live there and they, you know so forth. So, and in addition to our homes, those are our signature homes, because how we designed that is that it's a real estate play. We acquire these homes and we do lease options, lease purchases. So the home cash flow, which we see that the home is a val value, valuable piece of property asset to us, then we execute the purchase of it because then we can get a syndication we can get a group of investors to say okay yes i can prove them this house is a good house it has long-term and short-term cash flow and they can invest in the property together so together we can create a syndicate or a REIT to be able to own property at the end of the day once we own the property we can lease the property back to homework so that's more like the mcdonald's uh, model they're not in the, really in the real the hamburger business they're in the real estate business that's where they need their money because they own the properties and lease it back to their franchisees. So that was our model for the real estate. So those are our signature homes. Then we said, well, while we're at it, to be able to accelerate our footprint, we will also represent people that have guest rooms, guest houses, or vacation rentals and put it on our channel. So we have almost like 20 properties now that people that have properties, guest house, guest room, or guest channel, or guest vacation home all over the world, and we put them on our channel. So they're vetted. They've got background check. They all are members, so it has that kind of a collaboration. And uh, you know, you can choose whether you want just female, all female, or female and couples, or families, or kids, or dogs, or whatever. You can choose that. But majority of the ones, especially if they are living in the home themselves, they prefer the women because now you have you reducing your loneliness. You have collaboration and cooperation. You have um, if you go to if I want to go to France, I can go to France and instead of going to a hotel. Or Airbnb by myself, having gone to a home with this other businesswoman that can show me what's happening, where the best you know meetups are, the best meetings, or hair or nails, whatever. It's this collaboration. So people love to travel. More and more people are traveling now. More and more women are in business. We have three uh, trends that we really are that is really valuable to our, our our proposition. One of them is women. You know, women. You know, all the statistics say that you know, like forty percent of the businesses now owned by women, and the millions of billions of dollars. I think it's like forty-four billion dollars that we are going to be responsible for spending. So we are spenders. We're going to spend for our, our parents, many of us. You know, our families, our children, our partners, our homes, and our businesses. You know, so we have that the strongest. And then, uh, and maybe perhaps in our lifetime, we'll have a woman president. We have more women and heads of companies and corporations. So more women are graduating from colleges in the professional fields like medicine and law and so forth. So we have the women as our target market. And then also the real estate, luxury real estate has been come back. You know, all the different companies, whether it's even Airbnb brought a luxury home division. So people realize that that is a market that either you can get great deals at because they're not as people are not as active or it's just this appreciation is there, especially for the change of use. And then the next is the co-living, co-working space. That's a huge trend right now. I'm sure you've seen in just in the last years it's grown. You know, some the one statistic says up to fifty six percent, you know, it's grown and they estimate by twenty 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 two that about seventy or seventy, seventy four percent of individuals will be opting for that co-working living or sharing space. So if you have a couple different trends that you're following, then you know, and you can kind of find a niche for yourself, then it's kind of easy to be able to you know, move forward with that. And our, our goal is that we're building to sell. You know, we like to build this business to sell, and then that way I'll still have the real estate interest, but that I'll be able to, ah, you know, to be able to take it and sell it so that someone else can run it and I can, you know, Keep the real estate, sell the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is a bit, the homework is incorporated as a business and has the three revenue streams: the membership revenue, the host property re revenue, and the signature property revenue. But then the real estate will be each real estate property will be a separate LLC and keep that for the sale. So what do you think? What do I think? You think it's a good idea? I, I think timing is everything. <laughs> we have three trends going on right now. These are three ways that. Women in business, luxury real estate, and uh, co-living, co-working, and you're catching all three waves at the same time. Right. Uh, so that's a, that's, that tells us that timing is probably good. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. The timing is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> could could you describe a uh, typical uh, 
situation or a typical location where you have co-living and co-working going on? Like how many people, what size space, uh, you know, are they just co-living or are they co-working and co-living? Uh, give, give us a little more color here. Okay, all right. So there's a lot of spaces where, as far as the types of places, they're all over. I mean, it's hit, hit them some places now that they have, like, in, like Rome has places in like, a, it's kind of called Rome, like in Bali and exotic places where people just kind of want to retreat and go away. And there's like, we call those digital nomads, you know, where you can just take your computer and be able to do your business that way. Um, but there's other ones that are close to airports, convention centers, you know, colleges, you know, it's some, some people, you know, in lieu of dorms, they actually live in their homes. So it's basically, a, a, you know, the size of them varies from either, you know, you can have a tall, small two bedroom facility and they've done, I've seen somewhere they do like pods, you know, they have like bunk beds where they've got like four people possibly in a room and they share in the common spaces or you can have more of a luxury style where every, ours is that every person has their own bedroom and bathroom in suite um, so it depends what market you're working with um, and some of them as far as living and working some of them are just designed as co-living spaces but people have offices or desks in their rooms and they work from it but maybe they don't have special ours how we define ours differently is that we have special conference rooms or office areas that are specifically an office or a classroom that specifically can be designed to work in as a classroom or a co-working space so um, and then we have the studio as well, so that's also, also for those who want to do digital access. So they vary from in small places to large places. The audience from young teenagers that have just a lot of roommates. So, to so, so is it like executive suites with a bedroom? Mm -hmm. The bedroom, the bedrooms are beautiful bedrooms. And they just have a I desk understand. area. They have it's a desk area. it's more like bedrooms with executive suites. <coughs> okay. It's a home. executive. It's a home. I, I understand executive suites. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. But executive suites where the bedroom where I can sleep the night, is, it's an innovation. Um, yeah. I, I don't know of any in San Diego. Um, are these, are these uh, facilities going to be in residential areas or commercial areas? It or can is be that a, a problem? Com no, it can, be a com it can be a combination of it. It depends obviously how much traffic you're going to have to them. So we do it in <laughs> residential areas, but we're very low key. It, it, I mean, because they're members of our organization, they're not like we're not putting on Airbnb mm -hmm. or VRBO where just strangers are coming in. We, we have position ourselves that we have a membership organization. From time to time, our ladies live, or our members live in the home for periods of time. These are these. I've, I've been to her place, the first one. Mm -hmm. These are large luxury homes in gated communities. They're definitely homes. They're not office buildings. Mm -hmm. But there's a, enough bedrooms to have office space, exactly. meeting rooms, yes. and uh, studios. studios, and so on. Well, I live in a gated community, and I've got NIMBY. <laughs> I don't want that in my backyard. Right. Well, I and understand. so, uh, how do you, if it's in gated community, how do you steer clear of the HOA? Well, because again, I think part of the thing is that one of the person, one of the people are full time residents. See, I think people are, or the curse problem is that they feel that people are just getting these homes too for monetary reasons just to run people in and out. And it's like open to the public where people on Airbnb or VRBO, one of those sites, yeah. can come in. If someone's living, I live in that home full time, so it's my home. And so right. as my home, you don't, people don't expect one person to live in a 4,800 square foot by themselves. So they don't mind the fact that there's another roommate, another roommate, another roommate. So it's four bedrooms. I could, we don't have four people living there, but you could have four people living in the home or every average husband, wife, two or three children, there's gonna be five people in there. So it's, I think about the respect that you have for your community and your neighbors and the traffic. We don't have a lot of traffic coming through yeah. there. And that's all respect for our <coughs> homes and so forth. Now, some of them are, we also are looking at to um, do bed and breakfast ends. You know, that is already licensed and you know designated for multiple. Mm -hmm. So we could acquire, they're going out of business now. A lot of them are suffering because of the Airbnb and sure. you know, different hospitality, short-term rentals. So that's a way of acquiring those type of properties. But there's certain properties that are going to be in um, individually gated areas, you know, like the Palm Desert or certain areas where they have large properties, you know, two acres, three acres, where again, you're not impacting the community. And so I've seen the properties all over. I've seen them on the regular. And it, it also has to do with the, um, the owners of the property. If the owner doesn't mind the short-term rentals or they don't mind it, and then it's not impacting the neighbors. I think what the problem is, it's the neighbors. You're, impact, you're getting parties, you're, you're having a lot of traffic, it's the parking, it's things of that type that are become a nuisance. Then many times, it's, there's a lot of different pro types of properties and areas you can work around that. So how is the deal structured? Um, who owns the property and um, 
the people that live in, in um, you know, these uh, executive living suites, mm -hmm. um, are they owners of the property or are they just rent? They're, How members, does it work? they're, they're members. They become a member. They become member, a member. They're mem so a member. So most of them, if they decide when that property, decide to purchase that property, if they decide they want to invest in that property, then that would be their option. Because when oh. we, we, right now, we're. So you start out by leasing. Lease not, lease off, right. with, a, with an option to buy. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and then you uh, fill it up, see if it's working. Right. See if the neighborhood is appreciating. Right. And then at some point you decide to syndicate to buy the property. Yes. yes. And if I'm a member, <laughs> I have the ability to right. participate. Right. But maybe you get outside investors as well. Uh, yes. I think it's more outside investors yeah, that okay. we're looking at primarily. But again, it, we're not going to deny someone that, that's there. Um, I just want to make sure that you know, they understand that it's two separate things, that they, they own the property as a REIT or a syndicate, whatever that, that LLC is, and their, their stay is separate. And, and most of them are short term. Most of them are not there like for years and years and years. They're there because maybe that woman's there because she sold her house. So until she finds another house, she wants to stay there. Or someone goes through a divorce and she's deciding whether she wants to go back okay. or whatever. So it's just more of a transition type of thing for most people, or just a short term, a week or two weeks. A day, an hour. And how many such properties do you have now? We have one signature property and we have almost 20 host properties at this time. What is a host? Host property, property is when we represent somebody else's property. Oh, so I if see. you have a guest room or guest house, and that was just a way for us to be able to expand our blueprint and then to be able to, and the women want it. They want it to be, they want to be marketed. We are marketing, um, we're the marketing platform for them. We don't do the management, we don't take care of the rentals and the maid service and all of this stuff. We simply will market it. We know we're marketing it to our community. And for those uh, host properties, do you have an option to buy or not? No, most of them are owned by other people. Right. Uh, and we just simply, they take 8% and they re receive 92% of Got the it. revenue. And, and for your one signature property, um, do you own it or are you leasing it? We're leasing it now. We're leasing we're lease option it. It well, gives us a chance to, there'll be a year into March. So, so at again, some point you might buy it. Yeah, that's our intention. Our intention is that we get into a property that we want to buy, otherwise we'd be moving around. I'm not really that interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's this is going to validate it. And for us to be able to raise capital, so it's much easier for us to get into more properties as a lease sure. option initially and be able to build up our model. That was for me to um, to build up my concept. Uh, and so How much capital would you like to raise? Uh, 2.3. Million? Yes. And that's to buy that home? No, that's not to buy that home. That's to actually be able to get, acquire four more properties ah. and to, and uh, actually you four mean or five. Lease four more Yes, yes, acquire. to acquire, yeah, get yeah. lease option, more, four more, four or five more properties. So you want to scale, scale yes. the model? Yes, yes. Our first year was to bring the concept, and, and the second you, year was to, rev, to evaluate the, it, and the third or fifth year is to scale. Does your first property, um, is it working? It's working. We had to pivot a couple of different things, a couple uh -huh. times, and that's what the purpose is to see what really worked, what didn't work. What we find is that the long-term tenancy did not work because we're losing, we make more cash on the short-term tenancy, which makes uh -huh. sense. You know, if you have people tying up that space for 18 right. months and utilizing that many more resources, utilities and so forth and so forth, whereas it's short-term, a week, you know, it's, you know, I can rent it for a week and get more than I can for a whole month. Mm -hmm. with yeah, less course. brain damage. Right. Okay. Yes. So for the properties that you're partnering with, with homeowners on, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the one of the unique points of the model is that they have a, a desk and a working space in the bedroom. Yes. Is that something that homework would finance or is that something no, that the homeowner, the homeowner has homeowner. to modify in order to join your service? Yes, there okay. are certain criteria that we ask the homeowner to have. Now there are some exceptions where they have an office space adjacent to or very close to the bedroom. Um, if they're for some, like some of the older houses that are really quaint and beautiful and small, there's one in Silver Lake. Okay. Um, so they have an office space that the homeowner can use and the, you know, um, you know the uh, guests can use. Mm -hmm. um, but, but she flies all the time. She's an airline pilot, pilot, airline pilot so they have that use. But they have to have a Wi-Fi, excellent Wi-Fi service. They have to have, um, again, a work, live workspace. It has to be private, private bathroom, secure. Um, parking option, you know, whether it's a good parking option, and they need to we kind of vet them, do a background check on them, you know, just to make sure that there's nothing that would be unsafe for the person that's coming in. They can designate whether they want animals or you know 
guests, overnight guests, they can designate whatever roles they want within their house, and we just mm -hmm. ask. And eventually, we would like to be able to find some consistency where we can brand all the homes eventually. Yeah. When you build that out, you know, maybe every home you go into will have white linens and white towels and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I feel that's going to happen when we're able to bring that homeowner enough traffic, enough revenue, that, that we're the only source of rental. If what they're still on Airbnb and other things, and that white linen and the white towels will get destroyed. Right. So what about students? Students. Sure. So if it's a homeowner, yes. It's like they can designate whatever they would want. They can, yeah, students, nurses, insurance, things. that They can designate what they would like. Because some of the homes are near schools, near colleges. Are there any in this area near UC San Diego? There's one home that's in, um, that's in, uh, she is near, what's that area called? Oh, this way. So I'm still learning San Diego. I just moved here. Haven't been here a year yet. Um, near Scripps Ranch. Scripps Ranch. She, yeah. She has a nice large house, and that would be appropriate for that type of, for students. But we have, and then we have a downtown condo. A young lady that has a two bedroom, she says, is downtown mm -hmm. San Diego. Mm -hmm. I see. So we vary. So we really, um, we're from here throughout the United States. We really have a lot of uh, connections abroad. So that's our concentration right now is to be able to get some in, you know, Europe, get some in Asia, get some in, you know, Canada, Australia. Just get some so outside. if one of these interns wanted to go get the money together and buy a home, use you to market the rooms. Mm -hmm. In this area, they mm -hmm. can do that. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then they could move all their friends in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. Just <laughs> it's study finance all, all night long. Right? Study right. finance, yes. I, I, I like your observation that entrepreneurship uh, can be a lonely uh, experience, particularly when you run out of money uh, and that you need a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Um, uh, can you expand on that, uh, particularly uh, uh, for women entrepreneurs, because um, you know there are not as many of them mm -hmm. as there are men, mm -hmm. and so women entrepreneurs probably face additional challenges. And can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I noted, I'm, I'm a seven, seminar advocate, and when I was really young, I guess probably like the 12, 13 that just really cemented this entrepreneur idea. I remember I would go to all these seminars and there'd be gentlemen on the stage, and most of the majority of them were all men, and uh, they were doing a great thing. I would think, okay, th they would say they're making all this money, doing all these wonderful things, and I would say, okay, that's easy for you because you probably have a wife that's at home that's either cooking or cleaning or taking, and again, this is 40 years ago plus, whatever, so it's a long time ago where it really was, probably had a wife at home that was cooking and cleaning, taking care of the kids, um, you weren't dealing with um, menstruation. You weren't dealing with all those other things, menopause that women deal with. So it's easy for you to be able to do that. And I said, I one day wanted a stage where it's all women up there. I want you to tell me how easy the journey is because you're dealing with what I'm dealing with. You're the one that's going to have to work with the guilt about leaving your kids at home, you know, under the day, whether you be a mother, whether you're being a full businesswoman. You're the one that has to worry about um, some cultures. It's not favorable. So you're going to have to go against the grain of not only your religion or your families, but your culture that finds it despicable that you're a woman in business and you chose that as opposed to becoming married and raising a family. You're going to have to go to the grain of these sources available, financing, lending, loans still today. We get the smallest side of that. And it does have something to do with our intelligence or our ability because I think that we, you and him agree and other people agree that women work just as hard if not harder. So you don't have to deal with what we have to deal with. Um, so that's why we need each other to talk to. That's why our husbands and our brothers and even some of the male mentors are not the people that's doing it because they, they don't understand our emotions. If we start crying, then all of a sudden we're not strong, we're not uh, powerful. It, in their eyes, it weakens us, it makes us soft, it doesn't make us as tough as we sh they think we should be to be able to go it. So we need other women to do that with. And then we need women that, and there's so much protocol about Okay, you said about money. If you're broke, you don't go to finance and don't let people know you're broke. Well, what about if you really are broke? Because I think most people, at, if, you go, if you're in business long enough, you're gonna go through a dry spell. I mean, I think, gosh, if Fry's and Sears and all of the companies in file bankruptcy because their cash flow has suffered, then why can't an individual, a woman, an individual trying to build her business experience the same thing? What is the difference? Whether you're being broke at a multi-billion dollar level or at a $50,000 level. You either need it or you don't need it. 
and many times. So those stereotypes that we can't do this and we can't do that, you know, and some of it's probably across the board, but most of it is that we have to suck it up and we have to, and we've heard in the past through some of our leaders that we have to lean in or we have to put on our big boy pants, our big girl panties. Um, we have to be strong and be tough. And they say, how you're doing? They don't really want to know how we're doing. They don't want us to pour it out. And we're emotional by nature. So that means every time we're not able to share how we're really feeling, we're holding back. So that's another burden on our shoulders that we have to carry just because. You know, because suppose, suppose we're not feeling well. Suppose we are going through menopause. Suppose we're doing whatever that happens naturally, not a fault of our own. Then we have to pull through that. So that's the hardest part, I think. And that's why we need the sisterhood. We need, I mean, even yesterday I was talking to someone. She says, I feel like I'm doing everything right. So I've been doing everything right. I've been studying. I've been getting certificates. I've been doing everything right. And yet it's still not easy. I'm still doing a job and I now have to sue the guy for the money. You know, she's only $7,000 and I did this amazing project and he thinks it's amazing. I'm it's amazing. I had to find an attorney to get collect my $7,000. Like, why did he even think that was even an option for him not to pay me for the work that I get done? And she's like, I keep running into these things. I do everything right. She is, she's talented. She's, she says, when do I, like, when do I, like, when do I realize that maybe it's not for me? She says, like, she wants to do a, a hotline on, for extraordinary women trying, the ordinary woman trying to do extraordinary things, just for women to be able to vent, you know, to be able to talk, so, like, you know, this is what happened. And we all have those stories. We all have this, like, certain things happen, and you want someone to be able to talk to, and you want to be able to be real about it. You don't want to have to fix it, clean it up. So how do you foster, uh, or uh, do you have a way to help uh, women, whether they're entrepreneurs or just business women, to, um, Form or join sisterhoods. Yes. How do you, how do you do that? You do it. There's a lot of organizations and there's a lot of there's masterminds. They have to be open to. It. They have to reach out. We have masterminds. We have we have a new one that's coming up now. We're at seven it's called our mastermind dinners where we're having a small group of women be mentored by seven figure women. Women that have built million dollar multi million dollar businesses. Mm -hmm. But they'll come in every month and those and everyone has had as a, a pivot at a turning point or something that made a difference in their business, whether it was getting capital, whether it was building a, getting a partner, whether it was building a magnificent team, and they're gonna share that with them and specifically coach the women in the room on that. But there's a lot of women's groups and organizations, there's a lot of meetups, there's a lot of, um, you just have to be open and you have to trust. Because some of them, some, you have, it's like a, anything else, you have to be able to trust the people that you're with in your group or organization. Um, and that you meet with this book club, there's different things that women have done to get together, but you have to be able to trust the people who's there and know that it's a win-win, it's not just you giving or they giving, that it's a win-win, and be able to trust that you can open up and share and not be judged. If mastermind's expensive, they can, be, they can be free and they can be a couple hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year. Depends on which one you're joining, it depends on the group, I think a lot depends on the peers that you're mm -hmm. with. Um, we've had some that we do for free. Um, we have some that we do for uh, members for four ninety seven a year, so it's like the five hundred dollars a year they can do on every Tuesday at ten. I have a mastermind, and then we have the ones the ones that we're doing now is thirty six hundred dollars. Fifty dollars a day. So, but there's some that are fifty thousand dollars for just a weekend, four times a year. Or some of them are hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. Right. But Stephanie Stephanie Hess, who's speaking next week, does masterminds. Come on, if you want to come back and meet Stephanie. Yes. Next week, next Thursday. Thursday. You're actually like a little competitive, but not really that okay. much. Maybe more together, you can build something bigger. Okay. Yeah. She doesn't Seminar. focus on women. Right. She she uh, uh, focuses to help uh, startup companies. Okay. Okay, so that really is a well. This is it's a startup. Well, this male female again. We're, I'm speaking to women right now because that's my niche. But the same, yeah. a lot of the same applies to men. Yeah. I'm sure men have the same challenges as well. Well, Stephanie, themselves. she's not doing the pro level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me just months. figure that out. So Next week, I'm same so time. Okay. Now, I, I can tell you personally, I'm resonating with what you're saying, but I just felt it was natural. I've been in a men's entrepreneurial prayer group mm -hmm. for 19 years. Wow. We meet every Friday morning. Wow. And we have breakfast and we pray with one another and we talk about our personal and business challenges and then we pray for each other. Fantastic. And um, there are six of us, uh, and it's just fantastic. And I've got other organiza 
other informal groups that I've started that, uh, like I have a men's book club, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and um, we read books, but we also talk about the same issues. Exactly. It just seemed natural to me to do this. Um, my, my wife is an entrepreneur, but she's a loner. Mm. And um, she doesn't have a desire to do this. Mm. And I thought, gosh, you just, you're just really missing out here. Yes. A lot of people don't know right. what they don't know. Right, right. And I think you should try And sometimes people will try one group and they say, oh, it's not for me. Mastermind's not for me. Yeah. It's just like going to one clothing store and saying, oh, they don't have any clothes. and not going to any other clothing store. You know, so you have to try, like going to a church sure. or whatever. You have to try and find your tribe, you know, and <coughs> you find what you resonate with. And sure. um, it's great that you guys have been this, but it's a life preserver. Yeah. It really is. It really it keeps you afloat. You know, yeah. again, whether it's mentally, physically, spiritually, <coughs> financially, that can be your, that's your life preserver. Or health issues. Health, yeah. exactly. Do you think masterminds should be local, face to face, meeting, praying, eating together? I think, uh, or think, should they be done virtually? I think they can be done whatever they need to be done. Yeah. I think they can be done both ways. I think if you, if you have the blessing of being able to show up every Friday morning, some people can't. You know, so I think the virtual ones are great for people that are all over the world. Because a lot of the, the problems and a lot of the solutions are going to be the same. But um, I think actually meeting with people is always great. But I think it yeah. should be done. If it has to be done virtually, then do it virtually. Yeah, we, we used to, I used to, it was just a, a men's breakfast group, right? Mm -hmm. And then after five or six years, we changed it to a covenant group where we mm -hmm. covenanted to be there. And we also said unless somebody's really sick or there's a business meeting that's outrageously important, mm -hmm. you will be there. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's just made a huge difference to me. It makes a huge difference for yeah. anyone. In your definition, what's the definition, in your words, what's the definition of a mastermind for those who are new to it? Well, first of all, I have a men's team I go to once a month. Mm -hmm. Is it mastermind? I mean, it's, it, it's all it, about business success. Right. But it's very personal. So the men talk about their families and how yeah issues of their children and money and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And actually I go three times a month because there's a two different mm -hmm. circles. Mm -hmm. But it's not a mastermind. So we're not actually... To define mastermind, what would you define mastermind? Yeah. Mastermind's an organization, isn't it? No. Well, first of it all, a mastermind, would have, you'd have to have a covenant. We have a covenant. The promise to be, a covenant means a promise. That you actually commit to being there every month or every week. But a, I think a mastermind, the focus would be specifically on business. So I think what, so okay. I, I'm open to, I'm open to other definitions. What do you think? Well, let's go back to the original that started by, uh, what's Think and Grow Rich, I think is his name. Yeah, the author think, think and Grow Rich. Is by, um, Think and Grow Rich is someone, author someone, is... Someone Google it, Google it, Google it. Think and Grow Rich is not Dale Carnegie. It's the other... It's not... Um, Somebody Google Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. It's a, he was the first person but that defined mastermind. It was all about it was about the, think succeeding in your business. In your well, it was, it, was about, it was about the culmination... Andrew Carnegie. And, oh, Andrew Carnegie. No, no, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. Who, he, who coached Andrew Carnegie? He was... It was a person... Think and Grow Rich is... Was author, was... Who wrote the book? Napoleon uh, Hill. Oh, okay. Napoleon, Napoleon Hill. Hill. Napoleon Hill. It's Napoleon Hill. So those, he called it the, your kitchen cabinet. It would be the, the people that advised each other on their businesses. Huh. That was my understanding. Well, it's, it's, I think he also has a definition. It's the culmination of minds with one goal in mind. With one and goal. With yeah. one goal. A culmination of minds gathered together to achieve a goal. So that goal could be your individual goal, your individual goal, but it's the culmination of minds. So culmination meaning collection? Collection of minds. So it's like, you know, people, other people, their minds, their inputs, their, you know, their information to achieve a united I, goal. I think his idea was your, each person's mastermind would be focused on that person's business or career. At that time. And then like if, the, if, if another member wanted a mastermind, they would have to form a different mastermind. No, no, been, no, no, I think it's a call. I think, I mean, it's okay. So, <laughs> but I, I think the most, yeah, the most of the masterminds is like you, you have, it's a culmination of people, you know, that will focus on a specific goal at that time. So I don't think it's so, if okay. we have like our mastermind, we have, we have a person, a leader, you know, which is our mentor, and this particular one is well, someone who's built a multi-million dollar business, like a lead experience is best teacher, you can teach you through your experience. And then we'll have eight other women. And so they will 
she will tell her her thing, but then we'll coach you, and the group will coach you on a, a specific goal that you have. Maybe your goal is to get funding. Okay, maybe your goal is to build a credible team. So for the moment in that time, in that evening together, we're gonna focus, the group, the culmination of all of our minds is gonna focus on a specific goal, which is to be able to help you achieve. And with that kind of support, you'll be able to, and it could be, I think now it can be personal as well as business. It started off with business, I think now it's, because business is such an integral part of our personal life, it's such an integral part of our business life. Because even like with the um, the groups like Provisors and for, what's the other one? Vistage, Vistage, and the Vista Chairman Train. I'm a tra yeah, I'm chair that was a mastermind. Right, right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a chairman train. I didn't do it because oh. I was living in the Palm Desert and it was enough community, good business, yeah. but it was right. a good business. So I went through all their training to do that. So that was that. What would your definition be of a mastermind? Um, well, I'm not that familiar. Uh, I haven't read this book, but to me a mastermind is where you come together for a like purpose, yeah. and um, you mm -hmm. help each other uh, to pursue your dreams. Yeah. But I have a question for the uh, interns. Have you any experience, either here or you know where you grew up, um, in being part of a support organization um, that uh, helped you achieve your goals? Uh, I mean, other than your family, you know, obviously your parents to some extent may have helped you uh, or hindered you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, do you have any such experience like that in high school or college, or, college, um, or graduate school now? It's something, it's not like an organization, it's a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe five, ten people, so we mm -hmm. are familiar with each other, we are friends, so we chat with each other a lot and we will solve each other's problems. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's a little group, but it's yeah. not any organization. No, that's okay. And, and do you meet regularly? Uh, you have regular scheduled meetings? Yes, we don't call it regularly because we meet almost half a year <laughs> once a time because mm -hmm. we are all going to universities mm -hmm. in different uh, cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think if we go to work in the same city, we will meet regularly and mm -hmm. Yeah, more often. Yeah, well, some masterminds just meet, you know, four times a year or twice a year. Um, it's not, you don't obviously get as much accomplished. You know, yeah. there's not as much nurturing along the way. So, Probably. well, they meet virtually, for so like every month, and then a couple times a year they actually meet in person, which I think is a good combination. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of conversation online. And okay. We will right. chat with each other maybe every day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. What about anyone else? So, uh, good. Oh well, yeah, I kind of have joined, uh, you know. Uh, interest club in college uh, and uh, we have you know we went to do some uh, you know some uh, practical research together so uh, I have uh, you know become with several members we have become very uh, good friends and uh, uh, both of uh, all of us are like you know four five people uh, all of us are you know major in finance and uh, so every time we, we you know meet some difficulties we just support each other and uh, you know we meet uh, every week because wow. we are in same college. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, as we go to the different graduate school, uh, one of my friends go to, went to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and uh, the other, you know, uh, they are in Shanghai, you know, China. So we just talk online and uh, we support each other. So we face some difficulties, and we, we want to do something like uh, I want to stay in America. We I will share my idea with them and. They will uh, tell me what they think and do something like this. So we just support each other and pray for each other. Uh -huh. That's great. That's awesome. Nice. Nice. It's really helpful, doesn't it? Isn't it? Oh, yeah. What does it mean to you? Uh, I mean, yeah, just like my uh, family members, especially, you know, uh, something I don't want to share with my family, like, uh, like I feel lonely. Uh, in America, I don't want to share this feeling to my family. Right. I just feel shy. Mm -hmm. But I can share this feeling with, with them. I think, uh, yeah. In, you know, in 2010, they are my family members. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Amazing. What about you ladies? Um, in my university, uh, we have, uh, I and I were trying to apply for the graduate schools in the United States. We have uh, a girl abroad union and the founder is a man who has graduated from our university many years ago and he's not working, but he's still trying to help uh, the students in our university every year to yeah to applying for the graduate 
the graduate schools, and we have separate. Uh, we have, uh, I think, about one year. There are ten groups, and uh, we have a group leader, and uh, we have a fixed schedule for uh, the whole um, for culture. Of the, I mean, the applying culture, and yeah, and he's very kind, and he will coach us how to do all of these things for free, and he really wants all of us to apply to the school of Tokyo. And I feel very warm from that. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. People need people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether you're an entrepreneur or not, or whatever, just people need people. And as as much as you can stay connected and for whatever reason, whether it's yeah. praise for a book or yeah. for business or for personal, very it's all valuable. Yeah. It's all really valuable. Okay. So are there any questions that you have for me? Any thing that come to mind? Sure. Um, so you're marketing mostly or entirely to women with your with your business, correct? Only because yes, the fact that that's the database that I had. So sure. I could go out with as far as homework, I could go out and start buying leads and so forth and so forth. I said I have a community that I've nurtured and that we've gained the know, like and trust factor for twelve years. So I'm gonna market toward that. And so eventually we may extend it to doing homework for men and homework for co ed. Co ed would be the last of my list because it's, it's just has inherent problems, issues with, issues with, with sure. them. But especially because people will say, well, why not for men? And there's a lot of single men or empty nesters or men that go through divorce and they don't want to be. One gentleman told me the best time of his life is when he was in his dorms because he can watch the games of people and he wants to watch. So he's lost his tribe, so to speak. So I'm glad you branched well, that. I just worked in my warm leads. Since I got divorced five years ago, and there's three of us have been living together, three divorces. Oh really? Three yeah. guys? Yeah. So it's four all together? There's no three of us. Three together. of us, yeah. Are, yes. Now we're all breaking up because each of us are getting remarried and things. But I've had that for four years. We're all investment bankers. Wow. In, in, in business. In the industry. Yeah. Fantastic. And how was it? How was it? It's been great. I mean, we constant conversations about business. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's like a little mastermind. Right. Yeah. The like-minded yeah. is yeah. is really helpful because again, it's like so much support you can get just over the kitchen table. Yep. Yeah. Coffee. I'm thinking um, the first experience that I, first of all, I'm an Air Force brat, so I moved around continuously and um, I don't have any childhood friends at all mm -hmm. because we weren't in any one place long enough. But in college, was the, uh, my undergraduate Rensselaer Engineering School was the first time that I was stable where I could stay somewhere for four years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I kept looking over my shoulders like, do I have to leave? You know, do I have to get transferred? And I joined a fraternity. Mm. Um, and uh, that was a great experience to bond with other uh, guys. Uh, and of course, we all had common goal, which was to get, you know, good looking gals for dates, to drink as much as we can and avoid getting expelled from school. And that's, that's a mastermind. That was a mastermind. <laughs> and um, there were uh, six of us in our pledge class, mm -hmm. you know, to, in college with fraternities, you, have, you get pledged and then you become brothers. So the pledge class is, you know, kind of like hell week. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. And so um, every five years, my pledge class has a reunion back at school nice. uh, for homecoming weekend. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for the first uh, five meetings, we just met together and um, now we bring our wives. And it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the same with our wives <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, the wives say, I never heard that story about you, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I said, oh, they're just making it up. That you guys they're just making it up. You know? But it is, um, it's a, been a, lo a lifetime bonding um, that uh, kind of snuck up on me because I, it, I didn't plan it. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the prayer group, um, you know, I, that was more purposeful. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I tell people that, um, Finding a job is hard, but getting a good boss is even harder. And the good boss is more important than the job in terms of success. You really need a mentor, um, somebody that's going to uh, be a mastermind with you one-on-one. -on -one. And if you can do the same with others at, at that work, uh, then that's even better. That they're all gonna, they're all um, gonna be looking for jobs uh, this year do you have any advice on uh, 
trying to choose a job as opposed to start your own business? As far as choosing a job, just make sure, because entrepreneurship is not for everyone. You know, again, and I, and I, my two sons happen to be entrepreneurs, and not, I didn't wish it on them at all. I was like, I really hoped they would take it easier, because sometimes some of the other paths seem easy. It just depends. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. Um, but, and there's always this question about whether it's um, nature or nurture, you know, whether you're born an entrepreneur or not, and I've seen people that were not born an entrepreneur, but wind up being that. So I think that a job is a great way to be able to get training, for one thing. Whatever expertise, whatever industry you're going to study in, you get training from someone who's doing it well. You know, the meetings, the people, the systems, 